Leaving home is painful for kids, even kids who want to go, even kids who can't wait to go. They are walking away from everything they have ever known and ever loved. They are walking away from their support system. They are leaving their siblings and their dog and their best friend along with their parents. And that is not easy. And many kids, and I have experienced this myself, handle that best by being horrible to us. Dear Family is a podcast hosted by Rachel Steinman, a writer, an educator, and a mental health advocate. And Rachel gets us up close and personal, so we feel a strong connection, familiarity, and comfort with her guests. So settle in and join us as we search for true healing and journey with Rachel and her most interesting guests. Hi, dear family and friends. Get ready for another inspirational and eye-opening story. Thank you so much for listening. And if you aren't already doing so, please subscribe and share, dear family. It means the world to me and makes all the difference. Lisa Heffernan has an MBA from the MIT Sloan School of Management. She is a New York Times bestselling author who has worked as a financial trader and as a former vice president at Goldman Sachs. When her son went off to college, she burst into tears in the produce aisle and came to the conclusion that there was very little support for soon-to-be empty nester parents like herself. Lisa understood high school and college are when kids are making some of the most consequential decisions in their lives, and that parenting never really ends. So she partnered with a fellow mom and friend, Mary Dell Harrington, to create Grown and Flown, a Facebook community. Grown and Flown is now the biggest and most vibrant online destination of its kind, made up of countless thankful parents of teens and college-age kids who are looking for information, insight, and support. Over 500 writers, doctors, psychologists, teachers, college counselors, college professors, and even a college president have graced Grown and Flown with their personal stories or expert advice. Lisa and Mary Dell compiled all the intel they've learned over the years to co-author a book by the same name, Grown and Flown, How to Support Your Teen, Stay Close as a Family, and Raise Independent Adults. I speak for myself when I say with my own junior in high school that this book has already proven very helpful, and I've been recommending it to all my parent friends left and right. I'm so happy to have Lisa here, and she's now enjoying her empty nest with her husband while continuing to build on the solid relationships that she developed with her adult children, who have not just grown up to be happy and healthy and not just flown, but soared. Hi, Lisa. Welcome. Hi. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so happy to have you on Dear Family. And I read, well, actually, I listened to your audio book of Grown and Flown. And the book came into my life at just the right time because I have an 11th grade daughter at a highly academic school and we're just about to have our college counseling parent meeting. I think it helped me kind of take it all in and understand my place. And I just want you to know the moment I finished reading, well, actually listening to your book, I immediately sent an email to a group of about 20 parents at my daughter's school sharing why I think it's so incredibly valuable. And I'm so excited to report that we're all going to get together in a few months and have a book club to discuss it. And I think it's just a great way for us to support each other and our kids. Thank you so much, first of all, for that. That's incredible. And I'm incredibly grateful. One of the things that we've discovered over the last couple of years of running Grown and Flown is that parents really lose their community at this point in their parenting journey. So while while the kids were tiny, they had a lot of mom friends and a lot of mom and dad friends and people were sort of on this parenting journey together. The parenting process becomes very, very lonely in the teenage years. There's a lot of research that bears this out and we have seen it over and over again. And it's very sad because we reach the point in our parenting where the decisions become very, very consequential. The answers are far less clear. The problems are very nuanced. And we've lost that support that we had. And we also lose our experts at this point. If you think about it, you don't really go into the pediatrician with your 17-year-old son. He has that meeting with his pediatrician alone. Your kids are supposed to talk to their coaches and their teachers on their own. That's not your role anymore. So our experts in our community 
sort of fade away at the very moment we need them. So it's really exciting to hear what you're doing. That's exactly what parents at this stage need. I can see why Grown and Flown is such a powerful community because it's exactly as you said, like we still need one another. We still have concerns, maybe even bigger concerns. And our kids aren't necessarily talking to us or maybe they're moody or all of those things that we're trying to deal with. You said it perfectly. It can be a very lonely time. All right, well, we'll get more into the book in a second. But because this is called Dear Family, I love finding out a little bit about your family and your background. Sure. I'm the mom of three boys, now men, who are in their 20s. Mary Dale Harrington, my partner on Grown and Flown, and I started the site when our youngest kids were in high school and our older kids had just started college. I think I had a freshman and a sophomore, and I think she maybe had a sophomore or junior. And we were just feeling lost and confused. We were feeling like our teenagers and our young adults' lives were so different than ours had been at that stage. And probably even more consequential, their relationship with us was so different. We've since found out that this is all borne out in research. We have very, very different relationship with our teens and young adults than we had with our parents in mostly good ways, but it left us feeling a little out of our depth. So I had just sent my oldest off to college and my middle was either a 12th grader or a freshman. And I was struggling. I was struggling with how close we were as a family and them being so far apart from us. I was struggling to figure out how our relationship would continue with the kind of closeness that we had had when they were at home. So we started the site sort of as a discussion of that and our own grappling with how our families would grow and change. And we just realized that the story of five kids from Westchester, New York, just wasn't that interesting. And we expanded to, as you said, over 500 riders. Amazing. And I mean, you know, you had a different background. This wasn't something that probably was in your stars while you were working at Goldman Sachs. And I know that you are a New York Times bestseller. You wrote the Goldman Sachs, The Culture of Success. And it's about the last private partnership on Wall Street. And as a vice president, you were on the inside of the financial world at its highest level. I'm just curious. And this is kind of unrelated, but still fascinating. What was it like at the time being there when it was so male dominated? It was very male dominated. I worked on a trading desk, which was 12 traders. I was one of 12 traders. The other 11 were men. And that was pretty much the norm. I think it's as you expect. It's a very male culture. But I found that more and more I was working with men whose wives had careers and whose wives were doing interesting and dynamic things. And they were very embracing and very respectful of having a woman trader in their midst. I think it's difficult in some ways as you have a family. I took some time off, had my older two children, and then went back to trading. And I went back to trading with two small children, anticipating having a third child. That was difficult. Oh being, being a woman in their 20s working on Wall Street has challenges, but being a young mom in her early 30s working on Wall Street was a much more challenging job because it's every story you've ever heard. It's your nanny calling you, telling you that she's sick and has to go home and you thinking, I can't leave the office and you know, in a panic about what to do. It's that feeling that you have that you're struggling with where your babysitter or your childcare wakes your kids up in the morning and puts them to bed at night and realizing you've just become a parent on the weekends and not during the week. So it's all the struggles you hear about and that were repeated you know, by millions and millions of women. That makes me think because often we think that our kids just need us when they're young, but truth be told, they really need us during those teen years, maybe even more. Yeah, there's a lot of discussion around this, and I come down pretty hard on that side. It's not so difficult to have somebody who can do a wonderful job looking after a three-year-old. Their issues are relatively simple. They just need to be in good, safe hands. A 13-year-old has a lot of complex issues happening in their life. A 17-year-old has a lot of life-changing decisions to make. This is where nobody can replace you as their parent. This is when we're teaching them the fundamental values in their lives that we want them to live with forever. This is where we're you know, emphasizing the things that are so important in our family and laying that groundwork for them. Obviously, parents of teens have to work. But time with our kids becomes more important as they get older, not less. I agree. And it reminds me of that saying, little kids, little problems, big kids, big problems. Exactly. (laughs) 
I remember hearing that when I had babies and thinking, what are you talking about? And now, of course, it makes total sense. We spoke earlier and you had mentioned that their teen pregnancy is down and binge drinking is down. And you mentioned that marijuana use is up probably because it's legal in a lot of states. But we both know that depression and anxiety and sadly, suicide is on the rise. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that. And is this something that your community discusses? What you've described is sort of the good news, bad news um, about today's parenting. The good news is, as you said, everything that we worried about the most when we were teenagers, so driving while intoxicated, way down, smoking cigarettes, way down, drinking is down, binge drinking is down. The number of sexual partners a teenager will have is down. The number of unwanted pregnancies is down. So this is all just wonderful, wonderful news. And each of these things have a lot of different reasons. You know, parents talk to their teenager a lot more about these things. You know, there's a different story around each of these factors. But as you say, the really sad thing is that anxiety, depression, and ultimately suicide have all risen. Yes, our community talks about these things. And the value there is extraordinary. I'll give you a couple of reasons why I think this is. The first thing is there's nothing worse than feeling like you're the only parent going through something. And you can look at the statistics and you can know in your head that you're not, but until you hear hundreds of other parents discussing it, that's when you really know you're not alone. Secondly, lots of parents discussing something and their different approaches is eye-opening to us. We all only know so many people. We have a circle of friends who may be somewhat like us and they may approach their problems in the same way we approach them. There's enormous value in talking to parents who think very differently from you and hearing their different approaches. They may not be your approach. They may even reinforce for you why you're doing things the way you're doing, but it's super important to hear other ways of doing things. And finally, parents share resources. It's discussing your child's emotional health with them and finding the right resources, whether those are books, whether those are websites, whether those are experts, can be life-changing. And sometimes the best way to find those things is the same way we found, you know, which was the best bottle, which was the best diaper. We discuss these things with other parents. Now that our problems are, as we said earlier, much more consequential, we need to keep discussing those things with other parents. I completely agree with that. And that's one of the benefits of good social media. (laughs) I love the origin story of Grown and Flown, how originally you thought it was going to be mostly about like what empty nesters were going to do. Can you tell us a little bit about kind of how it got rolling? Yeah. So we thought we were facing the empty nest, which we were. Our children did leave home and they did separate and go on with their lives. So that's the good news. But we thought that our relationship with our teens and our young adults, so our 18 plus kids who had left home, all five of our kids, Mary Dale has two and I have three, all five of our kids went to college right after high school. We thought our relationship with them would be somewhat like our relationship had been with our own parents. So I think we imagined a world where we would talk to them periodically. I don't know about you, but I spoke to my parents once a week on a long distance phone call. And we spent about half that call discussing how expensive it was to talk on long distance. You know, it very much loomed in all of our minds that this was an expensive form of communication and one that we wouldn't have squandered. And we saw our relationship with our children continuing in the way our relationship with our parents had been. Nothing could be further from the truth. And it's not just the technology. Of course, phone calls are essentially free. Our children can communicate with us in 10 different ways, at least, when you count all the social media. And they communicate with us one-on-one. They communicate with us in group chats. They communicate with each other. So that whole dynamic of how we communicate has changed. But there's something much more important that has changed. And that is what changed the trajectory of Grown and Flown. Our relationship has fundamentally changed. And there is tons of research that bear this out. They talk to us more. They confide in us more. They want to talk to us about their romantic life, their professional life, their academic life. They talk to us about what's on their mind. They see us as an ally and somebody to come to with their problems. And there's enormous benefit in this. If you think about it, when we were 20 years old, and we had a problem, let's say, in a summer job or in an on-campus job or something we were doing, we would probably have gone to another 20-year-old to discuss our problems at work. We would have sought the advice of someone who knew no more than we did. 
our kids are much more likely to come to us. And that communication is a lifetime thing. So we envision parenting sort of stopping or diminishing in some very dramatic way once our kids lived home, as it did for our parents. And that's turned out not to be the case. And that is what we hadn't anticipated. And we hadn't anticipated that the site would be certainly about parenting in high school. The site actually really starts from parenting in middle school because parents in middle school are already thinking ahead. But it really delves into how we parent young adults who we are still in many ways actively parenting because we have such a large role in their lives. Well, selfishly, I'm happy to hear that our kids want to be with us because I adore my kids. Like yeah. I, it, That makes me so happy. All right. So back to anxiety. There's this podcast called Gangster Capitalism. I don't know if you've heard it. It's about the college scandal. And in episode six, they mentioned that 50% of high school kids deal with mental health issues over the stress of getting into college. And that seems very high, and yet it makes sense. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on why you think it's so much more stressful now than ever. I have some ideas why it's more stressful, and I have two things that I hope can be small adjustments people can make in their lives that perhaps will have some big effects. One reason it's more stressful is because it's public. Right. So everybody talks about it. It's on social media. We see it everywhere. What happens to you in the college admissions process is something that not just your four best friends know about, but everyone you've ever known knows about. So that creates more stress in every way, in every aspect of our lives. And this is just one thing. And the second is, you know, this culture of deciding that there are a few schools that everyone needs to go to and that everything that happens in our lives will fall in place from that. So let's talk about that second one. It's not true. There's a wonderful book by Frank Bruni. One of the things we have done in our book is we have done interviews and pieces on some of the best thinking around a lot of these topics. And we interviewed Frank Bruni, who wrote, Where You Go Is Not Who You'll Be, about the college admissions process. It is a fantastic book for anyone to read. If you read the interview we did with him, we ask him some of the toughest questions around this topic. But we're hoping that by reading that, it'll make parents really want to go right buy his book as well, because it's very much worth reading. So one is debunking the myth that it is the be-all and end-all, and that there is just a few paths to that be-all and end-all. It's not true. We as parents and adults know in our working lives that so many people got to so many places from so many places. We just need to look around ourselves to know that that's not true. The second thing about the so many people knowing where we started, the so many people knowing so much of what you're doing and how that increases the pressure, we can help our kids with that in two ways. And this is two things that we, again, write about in the book that experts suggested to us. The first is controlling the amount of conversation around college admissions that happens in your home. If high school becomes nothing more than trying to get into college, we have done a cruel disservice to our kids. We all remember high school as being just an amazingly important sort of consequential moment in lives. If you ask people questions about the people they knew in high school and the things they did in high school, those things loom large for the rest of our lives. If that entire four-year period becomes nothing more than about getting into college, that's a sad, sad state of affairs. So as parents, we can do something about that in that's making rules on our house where we're going to talk about college maybe on Tuesdays and on Sundays, and the topic is off the table the rest of the time. So we can control how much of it has seeped into our house. I think I describe it as a dark fog that seeped under my front door and never left my house for years. That's how it can feel. And we have some control over that. And the second thing, and I thought this was just a moment of genius. I interviewed a woman who is a college counselor in Menlo Atherton. Menlo Atherton High School is in the Silicon Valley area. It's a high pressure high school full of a lot of parents who work in the high tech industry. And this is sort of ground zero for a lot of the pressures that you were just discussing. She said to me, one of the biggest gifts we can give our kids is permission not to discuss this topic with other people. So as an adult, imagine perfect strangers walking up to you and saying, so did you get that promotion? Are you up for this job? Have you interviewed for three other jobs? What was the raise that you got? When do you think you're going to get promoted? We would lose our minds if people talked to us that way, but we think nothing of talking to high school juniors and seniors this way. We can give our kids permission not to answer those questions. We can give them the language to use, and we can give them the permission to keep their private information to themselves. They can say things like, you know what, my family's decided that we're just going to keep this conversation among ourselves until I have something to share, or 
as soon as I know something about the college admissions outcomes, I'm going to share it with everyone I know. But until then, we're keeping the conversation just within our families. We can give them both the permission and the language to use to stop that barrage of questions that they get starting with when they turn 16. Okay, well, I love that advice so much because I've seen it happen to Amber already. Like people find out how old she is and that's the first question they ask her. And then I see her expression kind of change. Like, I don't know yet. But I love that I, I idea. That's of the, the only important thing about her. Right, exactly. And I love the idea of telling your teenagers, you have permission to say, we're not talking about it as a family. Yes. Yes, that's really, that's give them the language really good advice. And give them the language and allow them to put the blame somewhat on you. You that's know, right. we're, we're fine with being the heavies. You could say, my parents ask that I not discuss this, or my parents want to keep this within our family until I have some news to share. Let them blame us. Whatever it takes. Incredibly helpful. It's our job to protect them. And this is a way of protecting them. That's right. And also, they're more than their college admission. You know, if our culture is that's the first thing we ask when we find out how old they are, that we have to kind of change as a society as well. And it's a reminder to those of us who have so much to do with and are in constantly contact. So you have a daughter in that age range, what that means, of course, is you're in contact with dozens and dozens of kids in that age range. It's a lesson for us not to do that either, to not ask those questions, that it's not fair, that we're only increasing the pressure on them, and then that's not any of our goals. I totally agree, and I'm so grateful for that reminder, and that's why I'm saying this came at the perfect time. (laughs) I know that you discuss that we really should not be comparing our kids to other kids, which goes along with what we're just talking about, or even their siblings. And, you know, as a parent, I know you sometimes find yourself saying, well, your sister never did this and I have to bite my tongue. And I can see it being even more consequential with comparing other kids with school. Can you just kind of just tell us a little bit about why that's so important? You know, it's so important because it negates their individuality. It's so important because it says to them, I don't see you as an individual. I see you as someone, a group, and need to be compared with that, the group. We also look, turn the tables like we were just talking about. What if your daughter said to you, well, you know, so-and-so's mom's got a much better career than you have. Wow. A, that's pretty hurtful. And B, that doesn't mean I'm still not the most amazing mom ever. It's so important that we see our kids, A, for who they are, that we celebrate them for who they are, that we recognize the values of them. I'll tell you a one-minute story. I was thinking about this the other day. I was walking along, thinking about the story, which I'd forgotten for a while. I was at Target one day standing in the returns line. And a woman looks at my son and says, oh, are you in high school? Are you in college? He was maybe a freshman or sophomore in college. And he said, oh, no, I'm in college. I'm just home you know, for break or home for summer. And she asked him where he went to college. And he went to a local college near us that was well known. My son was nothing now to her. She didn't say anything to my son. She turned to me and said, oh, good job, mama. And I remember thinking to myself, first of all, him having gotten into college, nothing to do with me. I didn't study hard. I didn't pass tests. I wasn't the one who applied. That was him. So don't look at me because he did it. Second thing is, you know nothing about me. You know nothing about how I parented this kid. You know nothing about whether I was a kind mother, a giving mother, a loving mother, or a cruel mother, a negligent mother. You know nothing. You have decided from this one tiny piece of information, this one word that he just said, that I'm a good mama. And I just remember being horrified in this moment. And realizing this isn't to diss her. I don't know who she was. I never saw her before. I never saw her since. I, don't, I wouldn't recognize her if she was standing in front of me. But I thought she, think she embodied so much of what's going on with us now that we don't see people for who they are, that we see all these labels. And that isn't who we want to be. And that isn't the value that we want to convey to our kids. So we have to be very careful when we do that to our kids. I thought it was a terrible lesson for my own kid who realized he was going to be judged forever on that label. I think in the book, I describe it as walking around for the rest of our lives with you know the stickers that go on the back of you know, your car Absolutely. window? I feel like we all walk around with them on our foreheads. That's not who we are. That's just a school that once accepted us for one reason at one point in our lives and was for short years of our lives. Anyways, that's a label we want to get rid of and we want to get rid of a lot of the other labels that we put on our kids. Yeah, no, I think that's, again, another great reminder for us parents. I know I have congratulated parents for doing a good job. And that's a really powerful reminder that it really, we're there to support our kids, but it's really 
our children's journey. It's not ours. And also the idea of labels, it's something we talk a lot about in Dear Family because if you are dealing with a mental health issue, it does not define you. It's just something that you have, but it's not who you are. Yeah. I think the congratulations to parents when their kids get into college, I think the congratulations that we want to convey is, I'm happy for you that your child got what they wanted. I'm happy for you that your child worked hard and wherever that was, whether it was the local community college, whether it was the military, that they are on the direction in their lives that they want to be going. And right. you know, I'm happy that that's the success. Success isn't that they got into X school. The success is that the kid worked hard to get a place they wanted to go, and now they're able to do that. That has to be for whatever the outcome is. Lisa, you are a New York Times bestseller for mm-hmm. Golden Sachs, The Culture of Success, and you also wrote Be the Change, which is a book on the importance of giving back. And now you've co-written this book, Grown and Flown. I'm wondering how this book compared to writing the others and what's been the reaction to this book? In some ways, it was very similar. All the books that I've written were very heavily interview-based. I am an expert in absolutely nothing. So I had to go out and ask a lot of other people a lot of questions. That is where the similarity begins and ends. The other books I wrote entirely myself. So What you are hearing are certainly what people had to say, but it is me writing the book. This book is very different. This is not the Mary Jell and Lisa show. This book is very much us giving voice in the form of this book to a lot of experts around a lot of topics. When I interview Frank Bruni, you're hearing Frank Bruni's research and Frank Bruni's understanding of the topic around college admissions. When we interview with a college president or a piece about a college president, it is from his years of experience of watching class after class after class of freshmen come in and seeing what creates a good fit for a college student with a particular college. And so we have pieces by, we interview, or Lisa DeMore wrote a piece. Lisa is a psychologist who's well-known in the field of stress and anxiety, particularly around teenage girls. She wrote a book called Under Pressure, which everyone should read. And Lisa wrote a piece for us about how you help your older teen who may already be in college when they need mental health care. So the colleges are overwhelmed and they are under-resourced. And she gave some really good insights about some of the best things you can do if you have an 18 or a 19-year-old who's struggling with their mental health in college. This book, while I wrote a lot of it and Mary Dell wrote a lot of it, we also spent a lot of time putting together the very, very best voices from the smartest people we could find around the topics that were interesting to parents. And that makes it very different than the other books. It's been well-received. It's been incredibly well-received. We've been thrilled to see that. We've been all over the United States speaking about the book. Everywhere we go, we do an exercise. If you don't mind me jumping in on this topic for a sec, we do an exercise where we put up very large pieces of paper, those huge kind of things that you use like when you're talking in front of a group of people. And we put one up that says mental health, and we put one up that says college admissions, and one that says physical health and family life, and all the different topics that might be on our minds about our teenagers' lives. And then we give every person in the auditorium, and we've done it with 50 people, and we've done it with hundreds of people, a post-it note and ask them to write the thing that is uppermost in their minds around their teens' lives, what's keeping them up at night, and to put it under the category where it's relevant. And the mental health and happiness page is, there's rarely room to put so many post-it notes. It is uppermost on every parent's mind. Wow, that brought tears to my eyes. I mean, that's where I would put it too. You know, I mean, because ultimately it's not where they get accepted to. It's about being in the moment, the only time we have, and we want our kids to be happy and feel good. And so I love that. I love that. I just want to say about Grown and Flown, I haven't had the opportunity to read your other books, but what I really loved about it is it was not preachy. It was very practical and helpful and valuable. And it's nice, you know, there was no judgment. It just, it felt like When you were done reading and listening to it, you had a lot of support in your court to help you and your kids. And so congratulations on that. Thank you. That's really wonderful. Thank you. We hope that it also gave people further reading in the sense that when you read the section written by Lisa Damore, or there's a section, Rachel Simons is an expert on girls and perfection. She wrote a piece about girls and perfection. Mm -hmm. She has a lot more writing on that topic. We have, you know, 15 pages from her. She's written hundreds. 
So we hope it'll also give parents places to go for further study. Absolutely. And also, I mean, just on the practical note, like I never thought about having to make a first aid kit and what would need to be in that first aid kit. Things like that, as my daughter is home now, sick with like major swollen glands, mm-hmm. I can't help but think ahead of like, oh my God, what's going to happen when she's in college and she's, you know. So it's really very useful in addition to also having a lot of avenues to further explore. One of your big takeaways, and we talked about this at the beginning, is that we should be optimistic that our kids want to hang out with us, right? and come back to us. We spoke about growing up in the 70s and 80s, how there was that nuclear family, and then you went off to college and you didn't really come back home necessarily. What I have been hearing so much of is that our coming back home, partly because I think it's just cost of living is so expensive. Is this something that you're finding a lot of chatter about? Yeah, there's a lot of discussion about this because this surprises parents. And you're very right in saying it is absolutely because of the cost of living on their own. When you look at what their salaries are, and when you look at the amount of that salary that is consumed by rent, particularly in the largest cities in the United States, it does not compare to what parents had when they came out of college in the 80s or the 90s. We paid a much, much smaller amount of our salary and rent, and therefore had obviously a lot more financial resources to live on our own. But what we do find is that most parents have discovered this is temporary. So it can be a little alarming at first that they come right back after college. Some of it is they don't know their direction. Some of it is that they can come back and that they feel comfortable coming back because they are that close with us. They don't feel the need to push us away and cut us off in the same way that we did with our parents. If you're a high school parent, you may be experiencing your kid feeling that. I mean, that's a normal thing that they need to do to go off to college. But college parents are often finding that their kids are sort of coming back around to them and don't need to separate in the same way. Yes, parents are often concerned, but more often than not, we're finding that it's temporary, that it's, you know, saving some money, figuring out their direction, you know, getting their legs underneath them, and then they're moving on to independence. In the book, you talk about difficult conversations that we need to have with our kids about drinking and drugs and driving and sexuality. Do you have any thoughts or advice on how to get our teens to confide in us or open up? Yeah, I went last night and listened to two people speak. One was Karen Natterson, who's a physician who's written this great new book, which is actually not even out yet, called Decoding Boys. And the other was Peggy Orenstein, who's written a book called Boys and Sex. And I thought this analogy they made was great last night. They said, you know, we teach our kids table manners. And how do you teach a kid table manners? You talk about it over and over and over again. If you mentioned table manners once, would you think that your job was done or do you think that they would use good table manners after that? The tough topics that you're just talking about, whether it be around drug use, sex, how we treat people, that's probably the most important conversation that we have of all the conversations we have with our kids. Those conversations need to be had over and over and over again and they need to be happened over years and years and years. So that's the first thing. A lot of times we feel like, oh, well, I had the conversation about drugs. You didn't have the conversation about drugs if you didn't have it 20 times. How do our kids learn anything when we say it just once? So that's one thing. The second thing is having the conversation slowly. So inclination is sort of to just jump in there with two feet and talk about everything all at once, and we risk overwhelming our kids. So the conversation can best be stepped into gently by talking about events in our world or events that have happened in their school. I remember one of my kids had a classmate get in trouble for alcohol use, and I didn't really think the kids were drinking yet. I had kind of underestimated things. So first of all, it was an eye-opener to me that the kids were already drinking. Second of all, it was an eye-opener to me that kids were drinking so much this kid had been hospitalized, and this was in high school. So this is an opening. I can't let that moment pass me by. So this is a way to jump into the conversation that doesn't seem like extraneous and out of left field. And then The tried and true advice is is absolutely the truth. Try and talk to your kids in a situation where you're doing something else and you're not having to look them right in the face, particularly your boys. It is very, very painful for boys to have these hard conversations and have to look you eye to eye. So the easiest place for that often is in the car, but it can just be when you're doing something side by side or when you're doing a task around the house where there's physical exertion 
let's say you're, I'm going to make something up, you're raking leaves. It makes it less intense. It makes it look like I'm pinning you down and having this conversation about birth control and you're not going to move. It allows it just to be a little bit more natural and a little bit more at ease when we're doing something else at the same time. It's so true about the driving thing. Yeah. You know, so one of the things that I do is I go into schools and I've spoken to parents for this program called Ending the Silence for NAMI about warning signs and for mental health issues and resources. But one of the things I would add to this topic is to also make sure that they have a full stomach. I find that like if I'm trying to have a conversation with my girls and they've just come home from school or they're tired, or they're hungry, you kind of want to look for that, the right moment, the right circumstance when they're not rushed to get someplace or, right? So yes, to kind of consider that also. So you mentioned on your website, which I actually love, there's a place for questions and it says, do your kids know that you're writing about them? And do you worry they will retaliate with their own blog, which just cracks me up because here I am talking about my family constantly. <laughs> How did your kids handle this platform when you first came out with it? So I'm going to throw one of my kids under the bus here. Okay. But since, <laughs> but since I have three, you won't know which one. So when I told my kids I was starting this, one of my kids sat down and helped us get the website up. I didn't actually know how to get a website up. I had never done a website before. Now I know how to run a website, but at the time I didn't know how to do it. So he literally like sat us down and did the tech for us. Another son has a technical background and he helped us you know, answering some of my questions as we started running the site. My third son said to me, wait, this is going to be a blog for old mommies. Nobody's going to read that. <laughs> the beauty of having a child who is now a young adult is that they can admit that they were wrong and celebrate with you. So it's been a wonderful experience. Our kids have been incredibly, all five of our kids have been on board with this. They have helped us through the process. They have contributed content. They've contributed ideas. We publish a lot of lists for like graduation gifts or what to get your kids when they move into college. And they've given us all sorts of great ideas. But the one who was so skeptical has, I have to say, become my biggest champion. So, um, so they have great. come full circle. Also, I mean, I'm sure they're very proud of you. You know, I mean, they must have been proud of you when you were a vice president at Goldman Sachs. But this is another level of seeing you help such a vast community of people across the world. So that's really I, wonderful. I think the important thing for our kids, and it's easy for us to forget this as we go through our 40s and 50s, is that they still need to watch us trying hard things. Our parenting role becomes different, but your 21-year-old still needs to see you get outside their comfort zone to remind them that they need to do that. They need to see you fail. They need to see you discuss those failures and then just get back and do it again. So those kinds of examples of how adults find success on their own terms, that part of our parenting never really goes away. That becomes a lifelong role of ours to show them how to do this. Right. Because, you know, even if they act like they're ignoring you, they're watching you. Yeah. <laughs> they're watching every move. Again, I'm talking about my junior just because I'm speaking from personal experience and I'm already feeling sad about her leaving for college. What advice do you have to get your kids to choose a school nearby and come visit every few weeks? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. What insight do you have really for us parents to just start thinking about that transition? There's certain things we can talk about the transition. Well, let's talk about one of the pleasant things and one of the unpleasant things. So one of the pleasant things is to move into the ways that we're going to stay in conversation with our kids. So we're not going to see them every day, obviously, if they go away to college. To begin talking about like how we're going to keep in touch, what works for you. There are kids who Snapchat with their parents. There are kids who communicate over Instagram. There are kids who want to be in a family text. There's kids who want to text. There are kids who like to FaceTime. There are kids who like to Skype. So begin talking about and even sometimes using the forms of communication that you're going to use once that they're gone. You probably don't need to Skype with the kid in the next room. But if texting is going to become a bigger part of your life, or if Snapchat and you're not on Snapchat and that's the way they want to go, you know what? You're getting on Snapchat. So <laughs> finding the way you're going to communicate and begin. Or TikTok. Oh my exactly, God. Exactly. Exactly. Whatever it takes. Find what works for you. And it may be that you try one way and it doesn't work. And you find that out, you know, you try something else. So doing some of that experimentation about how you're going to maintain that closeness and that communication once they're in college. We are not talking about controlling them. We are not talking about telling them what to do. 
We're talking about continuing that sort of loving relationship that we have with our kids that has been shown over and over again to be a positive influence in their lives, even their young adult lives. But the second and really important thing about this transition in these later years where you're just starting to enter the middle of 11th grade through 12th grade is there's a well-known phenomenon called soiling the nest. And when I ask parents who have kids in college if any of their kids have done this, I usually get a very large laugh and a lot of hands shoot up. So this is the phenomenon where our 12th graders particularly begin to push us away because they have to. Leaving home is painful for kids, even kids who want to go, even kids who can't wait to go. They are walking away from everything they have ever known and ever loved. They are walking away from their support system. They are leaving their siblings and their dog and their best friend along with their parents. And that is not easy. And many kids, and I have experienced this myself, handle that best by being horrible to us. They become as difficult and negative and obstreperous (laughs) as they can possibly be. And they push us away. They make us the bad guy. And they do this in part because it's a lot easier to leave a parent who annoys you and makes you angry than one who loves and supports you. It's temporary. Usually for many kids, it's gone by Thanksgiving or freshman year. Certainly it's gone for most kids by the end of freshman year when they have successfully made that transition. Freshman year is a real difficult year for many kids. Not awful, but it's, you know, it has its own transitions. For us, it's important to be able to step back and say, this isn't about me. This is about them. He or she is being like this because they need to do this to push us away to be able to leave. And I'm just going to ride out this storm because I know it's not forever. It's interesting. It's almost like another developmental milestone, like when kids were little and they start walking and they develop separation anxiety. You know, it's like, it's something that we need to remember is normal. And what I love and continue to love about your site is that we understand that a lot of this is part of the transition and that our kids really do love us and want to be with us. I ask this question to all my guests. So Lisa, if you could, and I'm going to change it. I usually say 20, but let's say 18 because you're going off to college. So if you could write your younger 18-year-old self a Dear Lisa love letter from about what you know now, but you're giving your 18-year-old self some advice, what would it say? I think what it would say is that you're going to have many lives. So I remember at 18 feeling like I needed the answers. I remember my kids feeling at 18 like they needed some answers. They needed to know where they were going to go, and what they were going to do, and the direction they were going to have. And from what you said about my bio, you can see that you know I had a career on Wall Street, and I had a career as a business writer, and now I'm working in the parenting space. And I don't think this is unusual. I am watching so many 50-something friends sort of retire, and I put that in quotes, from one career, and literally just jump into a second career just as full-blown as the first one was in an entirely different field. So I think if I could have told myself it was one thing is that you don't need as many answers as you think you need when you're 18. There's this heavy feeling like you're laying down the direction for the rest of your life and your life will have so many directions. And I think that if I knew that, it would have taken so much of the pressure off. That's such good advice. And that just also brings you to like, trying to enjoy and be in the moment, right? Because if you're constantly worried about the future and having to stay in a certain lane, then you're not able to look around and take it all in. Yeah. So I love that. The last question is, do you have any happiness habits? Is there anything that grounds you? I would have to say, as trite as it sounds, it's absolutely my family. I'm married, which is wonderful and fantastic. And that's obviously a source of joy and support every day. I think having this relationship with these three amazing young adult men in the way that we have it, in the, I feel so lucky that I'm a parent in the 21st century, that I can have kids who text and message me or send me a picture of something that's happened in their lives. We're, we can stay in their lives in a non-invasive, non-controlling way, but still in touch with their day-to-day lives because they send us a picture of what they just ate. <laughs> and, you know, just what pleasure and happiness is that as a parent to see those things? Oh my God, it's so fun at, think, at Halloween when they send me pictures of all their costumes or just, just the little things that they do in their lives. I've said to my kids over and over again, like, there's nobody who's interested in every single thing you do except me. So don't okay. ever feel like you could give me too much information. I'm your mom. I'm interested in everything you do. 
It's true. Um, like, as you said, the picture of what they ate, most people would not care. Exactly. <laughs> But you're but their a mom, mom. A mom or a dad would want to see it, <laughs> or grandparents. So, I think the fact that we could have these little tastes of each other's lives, and it goes both ways. You know, I send them pictures of some funny little thing I saw, that we can sort of dip into each other's lives in a continuous basis. I described the phone as like a digital dinner table. The conversation that we had for the 18 years they were in our homes kind of continues in the digital space. It's in the same kind of vein that our dinner table was, that sort of random conversation that families have so that ping pongs over a million different topics over the course of a meal can continue in the digital space once they've gone. I love that, Lisa. I really do. In the show notes, I will have links to the Grown and Flown Facebook community and to your book. Is there anything else that I should include? Yeah. There's a guide to our book. Oh, great. I can send to you. Yeah, it's a guide to the... You know how in the book, there's a lot of sort of lists that are super useful that you almost wish yeah, you could tear, of tear, the page, tear the pages out and kind of carry them with you. We've got a guide to all that. So I can say. Wonderful. That. Okay, great. So I will include that as well. I really appreciate you taking the time to speak to me and I'm sure so do my listeners. And I just wish you and your family all the best and continued success. Such a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Lisa. Speak soon. Okay, bye. This is Rachel Steinman. For more information or to contact me with any questions, comments, or guest ideas, please check out rightnowrachel.com. That's right with a W. Thank you so much for listening, subscribing, and sharing, dear family. And if you found value in what you've just heard, I would love and so appreciate a great review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Until next time, I wish you love, happiness, and good mental health.